I am Allison Buckner, and I am one of the board members for the CACNA 1A Foundation, also a CACNA 1A mother. My daughter, Sammy, is 12 years old and was diagnosed at 10 years old. We are so lucky to have more just absolutely renowned scientists on this, on this panel. Um, so with that, I will do as quick of introductions as I can for two people with very long lists of achievements. Um, Dr. Snutch is on the faculty at the University of British Columbia. He's considered a pioneer in molecular biology, most well known for his cloning and characterization of the voltage gated channel, calcium channel family underlying the signaling responsible for physiological properties from neurotransmitter release and controlling neuronal ex excitability to pain sensation and epileptic activity. He has provided new therapeutic targets for congenital migraine, night blindness, autism spectrum disorders, epilepsies, ataxias, chronic pain, and psychotic disorders. An early adopter of translational research, Dr. Smutch founded Neuromed Technologies, later Zalicus Pharmaceuticals, advancing two novel calcium channel blocker drugs into the clinic and a new long-lasting analgesic through phase three and NDA approval in the US. In 2017, Dr. Smutch founded Cerevita, and hopefully I'm saying this correctly, Biotech, to employ a worldwide license for the generation, distribution, and sale of sale lines and animal models of human neurological disorders. He is an author on 204 research papers and inventor on 116 patents. His seminal contributions have been recognized through numerous prestigious scientific awards and accolades. He's a professor and senior associate dean for research at the University of Calgary, where he previously served as the head of the department. And I'm sorry, I've moved on to Dr. Zamponi now. And I've been home alone all morning in complete quiet. And of course, my husband and kids come home right when I'm on camera and they're talking loudly outside my door. So, um, but these are the, the days of Zoom conferences. And I know we all can deal with these sort of glitches. Um, so you've heard all about Dr. Smith. Um, 204 research papers, over 100 patents, been recognized through lots of accolades and scientific awards. Just like Dr. Smith, Dr. Zamponi is a professor and senior associate dean for research. He's at the University of Calgary, where he previously served as the head of the Department of Physiology and Pharmacology. He's developed a series of cal novel calcium channel blocking molecules for the treatment of chronic pain and epilepsy. Um, like Dr. Smutch, Dr. Zamponi has received numerous awards, holds many patents. He's a co-founder of Neuromed Pharmaceuticals and Zymedine Therapeutics. He's published hundreds of articles, given hundreds of invited lectures across the globe, and attracted over $25 million in research support. He's a Canada Research Chair in Molecular Neurobiology, as well as a fellow of both the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. So without further ado, because what we really want to hear from are the scientists, I will turn it over to Dr. Zamponi and Dr. Smetch. So first, let me thank the foundation uh, for inviting both Terry and myself to speak to you today. It's actually a great honor for us to do that. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have kind of a tag team presentation. I'll give you some very basic background on calcium channel physiology. Um, and then Terry is going to go a bit more into the meat of it with, with regard to PQ type calcium channels and, and, and mutations uh, that his lab has characterized. Um, so, without further ado, so um, you know, the, the, the nervous system really relies on four major ions for all of its function that's sodium, potassium, chloride, and calcium. And sodium and potassium are really responsible for the electrical activity of brain cells. They uh, are responsible for the electrical impulses that, that brain cells, uh, cells uh, send and, and uh, uh, allowing the brain um, to communicate uh, across a, a vast number of neurons. Now, calcium is a little bit special. Uh, usually uh, what you have is on the extracellular side of, of, of nerve cells have about two millimolar calcium. But on the inside of cells, it's very, very low, only about 100 nanomolar, and it's very, very tightly controlled. And when calcium rises inside cells, particularly neurons, a number of processes are initiated, and that include uh, the release of more calcium from, from reserves inside the cells, the growth of neurons, the regulation of the way the neurons actually fire action potentials, activation of calcium-dependent enzymes, and um, there are some types of calcium signals that trigger the release of neurotransmitter 
that then allows neurons to communicate with each other. And uh, in some cases, calcium ions trigger the expression of other genes. So you can already imagine that if you have a dysregulation of the amount of calcium that's inside a cell, you will mess with all of these different processes. And in the context of the cacna one a channel, neurotransmitter release and gene expression are two very, very important um, functions that cells have. And if um, these uh, are perturbed, you can get all sorts of uh, pathophysiological uh, processes that are being initiated. Now, the, the mammalian nervous system uh, has nine different types of calcium channels. There is an additional one that's found only in muscle. Uh, and they're grouped really into three subtypes, the CAF1 family, the CAF2 family, and the CAF3 family. And CACTA1A is a member of the CAF2 family. And for many years, scientists as myself and, 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 and Dr. Snotch have uh, tried to study the function of various calcium channels without an ability actually to see what they look like. And in the last three or four years, there have been tremendous advances in uh, uh, structural biology that now allow us to visualize how these calcium channels actually truly look. And so if I'm using my cur uh, cursor here, what you really have with particularly the CAF2 family here is a multi subunit complex that uh, consists of what we call an alpha one subunit. It's a very large protein and it controls the major function of the channel one it ends in the cell membrane. It allows calcium ions to pass from the outside of the cell into the cell. It allows the channels to open and close uh, in response to incoming electrical signals um, and uh, respond to a number of drugs that people uh, use therapeutically. Then attached to this alpha-1 subunit, which really spans the membrane here, is a very large extracellular subunit called the alpha-2 delta subunit. And it's very important for the trafficking of the channels to where they need to go in the cell. And so for those uh, that are interested, gabapentinoids, which are drugs that are used to treat chronic pain, target the alpha-2 delta subunit here. And then cytoplasmically, you have another subunit called the beta subunit, which also co-assembles with this complex also uh, regulates the trafficking of the channels to the membrane and also the functional properties. So this is what this looks like, right? It's a very, very large protein of uh, you know, two and a half thousand amino acids just in the alpha-1 subunit. Um, and so some of these residues that are making up the channel are pretty inert. You can change them and nothing happens, but then other ones that are very critical for function uh, alter the behavior of the channel in such a way that there is either more or less calcium coming into cells. Now, um, the various types of calcium channels have been associated with a number of, of, of pathophysiological conditions in, in, in human patients. So here's a list of a number of them. And you can see that most of the known calcium channel subtypes actually uh, can play a role in pathophysiologies. Highlighted here is CAF 2.1, which is CACNA 1A. And as you all know, that uh, has been linked to conditions such as uh, um, congenital migraine, ataxia, certain forms of seizures. But this channel is not unique. There are many other ones that have mutations that can, get, that can give rise to uh, debilitating conditions. And so children may be diagnosed with mutations in, in CAF 2.3. They may have epilepsy that may be hard to distinguish from what you might see with a mutation in CAF 2.1, even though the channel is totally different. And this applies to other ones as well, right? And then even in the accessory subunits like the beta subunit or alpha to delta, you can have mutations that are pathophysiological in nature that alter the behavior of the channel complexes so that you end up with the pathological conditions. So it's very, you know, really shows you there's a spectrum of these types of disorders. Now, if we focus on the uh, CACNA 1A channel, it, um, I'm going to highlight two functional properties that are really kind of critical. The first one is its involvement in neurotransmitter release. So what happens is these calcium channels, they sit in a presynaptic nerve terminal, when an action potential comes along, these channels open up, calcium will flow into the cell, the rise in intracellular calcium will trigger the fusion of a synaptic vesicle that contains neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter is being released, that is picked up postsynaptically by receptors and then the postsynaptic neuron responds with an electrical response. So when you have perturbations in calcium uh, channel activity here, you either get more or less neurotransmitter release and that's gonna affect the way the brain behaves. Another feature uh, that is associated with uh, um, uh, cacna one a channels, as well as some other calcium channel subtypes, is, is that when calcium comes in, 
that triggers a cascade of, of uh, cell signaling uh, pathways that ultimately lead to signaling to the nucleus where transcription factors are activated and a number of different genes are turned on in response to the calcium coming through a Cognac-1A channel. So once again, if you have a gain or a loss of function mutation in this particular calcium channel, you end up with a perturbation of gene transcription of many other genes, and you can end up with a, a, a wide spectrum of pathologies that are not directly linked to the electrical activities of these channels uh, in, in the classical sense, but really downstream signaling. Uh, complicating matters further, and, and, and Terry will give you a very, very detailed uh, overview of this, but I'm just going to mention it here, is that the Cognomon A gene encodes the CAF 2.1 calcium channel, but encodes, it encodes actually multiple types of that particular channel through a process called alternate native splicing. So the same gene can actually encode a very large number of different proteins that are closely related, but that are different. And it turns out, depending on where, the, where these splice variants are expressed in a cell or which parts of the brain, they may have different functions. And so here is just an example from a paper that was published in Neuron about a couple of years ago, where you have a channel that either lacks exon 47 or has exon 47, uh, linking differentially to the neurotransmitter release machinery in the presynaptic nerve terminal. Okay. So if a mutation manifests itself in one uh, of these particular splice isoforms, but not the other, you could have an effect on neurotransmitter release, but spare other functions and vice versa. And that is something important to consider when you look at the biology of these particular channels. Now, we also know a little bit about the physiology of these channels from mouse models. So all of the different types of calcium channels that I've mentioned to you have been deleted in mice. And what's interesting is that you can knock out certain types of calcium channels and you see absolutely nothing, okay? So you get rid of a particular type of T-type calcium channel, not much happens. You get rid of CAF 2.2 channels, which are closely related to the cac a channel. And you have maybe a beneficial phenotype in the sense that these animals have less pain, but otherwise they're behaviorally fairly normal. Then you have other calcium channel uh, knockouts like the skeletal muscle uh, calcium channel, if you get rid of that, uh, the animals uh, die immediately after birth because they can't breathe. So you can imagine you have the spectrum of different calcium channels. Some are very tolerant to mutations and others are not. Um, and so this is something to keep in mind as you consider uh, 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 how pathophysiological conditions act are generated through a um, calcium channel mutation. Now with cacna one a to me at least, it appears that under normal physiological conditions, uh, this channel is very much fine-tuned to operate in a very narrow window where it's uh, optimally functioning for uh, uh, neurons to do their jobs, okay? If you have a little bit too much activity of Cagnavon-A, you have a gain of function. If you lose a little bit of activity of Cagnavon-A, you have a loss of function. And with the gain of function, you can end up with familial he hemiplegic migraine um, as one of the consequences. If you have a loss of function, uh, that it has been linked to conditions such as ataxia and in some cases seizures. And then there are these polyglutamine expansions in, in certain types of um, conditions uh, such as uh, spinocerebellar ataxia type six, where the trafficking of the channel to the plasma membrane is affected and the channels aggregate. So that's kind of a loss of function as well. Um, and you again have a form of ataxia, okay? Complicating matters further is that some patients have a mixed phenotype of a gain and a loss of function in the same protein. So what does this mean? For example, you can have a gain of function because the channel opens a little bit more easily, but you can have a loss of function because there are fewer channels in the membrane. And so depending on the condition in a particular cell, there's either more Cagnavone activity or less Cagnavone activity. And then you end up with very complex uh, physiology and pathophysiology and if you think about this from a ph pharmacological point of view, how do you treat this, right? I mean, do you go after the loss of function? Do you go after the gain of function? Or is there some way to normalize uh, the activity of these channels to put it right back in that window where these channels normally like to, to, to operate in? So um, our lab and, and many others have looked at many, many ion channel mutations over the years um, in various different genes, uh, including Cacna1A as well as others. 
Um, and sometimes we see very, very big effects. So the way we do this is we, we take a, a, a DNA molecule that encodes the channel. We artificially introduce the mutation that is found in a patient into that channel. We then put this in an expression system that allows us to study the mutated channel and compare it to an unmutated one. Sometimes you see big things and you get a very clear, clear link between what you see biophysically in these systems and uh, what you, um, um, what the patient might actually experience. In other cases, you put the mutation in the channel, you look at it and it looks exactly like there is no mutation. And that yeah, makes it very difficult to then draw any conclusions. And more often than not, it's the latter case. So what could be the reason for that? Well, it might matter what cell you're looking at. So for example, you can express a channel in a, in a host system like we always do, but if some key components are missing that are only found in nerve cells that are responsible for the effect of the mutation, then you're not going to see anything, okay? I already mentioned the splice isoform dependence of the functional effect of mutations, and Terry will tell you more about this. So a mutation may have an effect in one splice variant, but not in, in another. I already mentioned the mixed gain of function loss of function phenotype, right? And then often you can have things that are not related to the biophysics, for example, of the channel, but it may be just related to trafficking or, or the other processes that put the channel exactly in the right spot in a neuron, but you would never see exactly that uh, a phenomenon in an expression system because it's not as complex as a nerve cell would be, okay? So there are some other approaches you can take. You can take stem cells from patients and look at the channel function there. You can make mouse models where you knock in a mutation that is extremely laborious and very costly and very low throughput. And also, um, once you have an answer, and let's say you find a gain of function or loss of function, we know of no specific druggable calcium channel 2.1 inhibitors and no activators, okay? So the pharmacology is very limited. Um, and so there may be, of course, um, uh, also issues when you discover a mutation in a 10-year-old patient that there are developmental changes associated with the mutation that have manifested themselves later in life that you can't reverse easily just with a drug and you have to be a bit more creative. Okay, so there are a number of drugs out there that target CAF2 channels, but most of them uh, target CAF2.2 channels rather than CAF2.1. And so the only really selective blocker of CACNA1A channels um, is what's called omega agatoxin 4A. It's a very large protein. It's derived from an American funnel web spider, very selective for the channel, but because it's a large protein, it can't actually be turned into a drug very easily for um, uh, CNS conditions. All of these other molecules target N-type channels rather than the PQ type. So there is actually a a lack of selective inhibitors of these channels that we can have as a, uh, as a toolkit. And then if you look at other clinically uh, used calcium channel blocker, if you look here at this column, right, there's L-type channels, T-type channels, alpha to delta subunits, as I already mentioned with the gallopentanoids, R-type channels, but you see nothing on PQ-type channels. So there are drugs out there that target calcium channels clinically but none that are uh, selective or, or preferential blockers of, of CAF 2.1. And so there is a need for drug discovery for both activators and inhibitors of these channels. And so far, there has not been a whole lot. And I'm gonna finish with one slide just to show you what is possible, okay? So this is a condition here that uh, involves a sodium channel. And it's a, a mutation in the sodium channel NAV 1.7 and it's a gain of function mutation. And it leads to uh, uh, erythromyalgia, which is a painful condition where patients would suddenly swell up, uh, turn totally red and are intense pain. And that's often precipitated by warm temperatures. And so, you know, patients will, will try to immerse their hands or, or, or limbs in cold water just to try to cool them down to get around this issue. And what happens here is, is that the sodium channel activates at voltages where it normally doesn't activate. So what's shown here, this is a bit of biophysics, here is a membrane potential and the probability essentially of a channel opening, right? Normally this looks like this. So you have to go to about minus 50 millivolts before you see a sodium current. When you have a mutation that is gain of function, that curve shifts to the left. So small voltage changes already activate the sodium channels and then pain sensing neurons start to fire action potentials. Now there turns out to be a drug called carbamazepine which is known to exactly cause the opposite effect. It causes a rightward shift, okay? 
And so with this particular molecule for this particular patient with this particular mutation, you can actually use a precision medicine approach by delivering um, carbamazepine <clears throat> and reversing the gain of function with a drug to normalize the behavior of the channel and it's effective. So now if you use your imagination, if you understand the biophysics of a PQ type channel and you have drugs available or, or tools that allow you to restore the normal behavior, then this is essentially an example of how you can target a pathological condition pharmacologically and bring relief. So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to pass it over to, um, to Terry from here on. Okay, let's see here. How do I share screen? Do, 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 do. How am I doing this? Uh, let's see, slideshow from the beginning. Is this, oh, is there a slideshow there? There is, yes. Okay, uh, so um, thank you very much, uh, Allison and, uh, and Lisa, both for the invitation and uh, uh, especially for all of your amazing hard work uh, 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 founding this foundation and putting the conference together. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, just switch from what Gerald uh, follow on from what Gerald said, uh, but talk about a specific uh, a condition associated with um, uh, 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 FH uh, with the uh, CACNA one mutations, and that's called familial hemiplegic migraine, type one. So FHM1 is an autosomal dominant disorder associated with migraine headaches with aura. Uh, and so autosomal dominant, of course, means that, that you only need one bad copy. Uh, and familial uh, uh, means that it's, it's inherited from one of the parents. So some, but uh, FHM comes in different uh, flavors, so to speak. Uh, and, and some patients can have simple migraine. Others can have very more, uh, much more severe uh, phenotype uh, uh, symptoms, hemiparesis, cerebellar signs, such as ataxia, nystagmus, uh, and in the most severe forms, uh, a, a, a slight injury to the head, physical injury to the head can cause coma and sudden unexpected death, also known as SUDA. All FHM1 mutations um, are actually uh, uh, missense mutations in the CACNA1 gene, or CAV2.1, or as us calcium channel people also call it the PQ type calcium channel. Um, so, so, just to, so just to remind you, um, uh, the uh, uh, PQ type channel does a number of things. Gerald mentioned that it's responsible for neurotransmitter release and gene transcription. Calcium coming in through the channel also affects the excitability of neurons. Uh, so it shapes action potentials and helps set the threshold for those action potentials. Uh, and is involved very importantly, uh, not only in just releasing the various neurotransmitters, but also in uh, regulating those neurotransmitters at synapses called synaptic plasticity. The, um, <clears throat> while it's often referred to as FHM for, for familial, there's also sporadic uh, mutations. So it can be, it can be sporadic uh, hemiplegic migraine also. And if you look at the, um, I'm not sure if you can see my, my uh, mouse here. If you look at where the various familial and sporadic mutations have been identified in patients, and there's many dozens now, this is only some of them, you can see that they cluster uh, in two, two main parts of the channel. One of them with this region with all these positive uh, uh, charges here, or positive symbols, is the voltage sensor. So that's where the channel uh, is um, uh, regulating opening and closing. And then the other regions are near the pore between these five and six in each of these domains. And so most of these mutations, if not all of them, are, are essentially in structural parts of the channel that control when it opens, uh, uh, which, which memory potentials it opens, and, and how calcium fluxes through the pore. Oops. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, there's a variety of phenotypes. There's a spectrum of of phenotypes in FHM and sporadic uh, hemiplegic patients. This just shows three of them. Uh, the R192Q and the K1336E are just amino acid, missense amino acid changes in these, these are separate patients. 
and they, ca they cause what's called pure FHM. So the, there's no other neurological signs. Uh, it doesn't progress uh, with, with age uh, slash developmentally. And it's, they have pure migraine headaches, quite a few of them, not very pleasant. On the other side of the spectrum, you can have mutations that cause very severe uh, phenotypes. So this S218L uh, causes cerebellar signs, progressive ataxia, uh, mild head trauma, can induce coma, and, and, uh, and it can induce sudden unexpected death. So there's a variety of phenotypes, quite a variety from mild to, to severe, including up to death, uh, it, depending upon the nature of the amino acid change in the channel uh, and where it occurs in the channel. So this is part of figuring out when we, when we think about targeting diseases, CACNA1 related G diseases, it's gonna be important to know what the actual changes to the channel uh, are at the amino acid level, the genetic level, and, and how we're going to attack those therapeutically. Um, so what, what else do we need to know? Well, if you look at FHM uh, pathological phenotypes, uh, they're localized to various parts of the brain. So the pain part of the migraine in, involves the trigeminal uh, uh, system. The seizures uh, uh, and ataxia are involved in other parts of the brain, the thalamus and the cerebellum. Um, and it's episodic. Uh, uh, very often, it's, it, uh, the, the FHM appears in the early teens and can resolve uh, in, in quite late adulthood. So again, we have these uh, different phenotypes, uh, and they're involving different parts of the brain, which is going to be related to how one would, would approach this therapeutically, uh, and, and it's, it's temporal. It's, um, so, so what we need to understand to, to start treating CACN1 disease, such as HSF. Uh, FHM, is what underlies this regional pathophysiology. You've only got a single CACNA1 gene, and it's expressed throughout the brain. Uh, how, how, why is the, or how is the, the pathophysiology regional? Pain versus seizures versus uh, ataxias. And what underlies the episodic nature of it? Why, why, if you've got this mutation in this single gene from birth, uh, why, why is it episodic? Why does it come and go, the, the, the various pathological uh, episodes? Um, and from that, from that information that we need to figure out is if we can identify, you know, the nature of the episodic and regional, what timelines, developmental timelines, would we actually aim to treat the disorders? Uh, can we actually even treat them regionally or temporally? Uh, and finally, a, a very important question would be, can we selectively target the disease uh, with regard to the, those regions of the brain that are causing the most severe uh, pathophysiology. So work that we've done and, and others over the years, and some of them are on this uh, uh, call or, or, or conference, <clears throat> some of the information comes from, from well, what, what can we tell about where CACNA1 is expressed in the brain? So this is a, a graph uh, of where CACNA1 is expressed in the human brain. And uh, there's six different regions here. And it's laid out with time uh, from uh, um, uh, embryonic to birth, just past uh, around 300 days or so. And you can see that the, that the gene is expressed very early on in development, essentially from the first points that one can, can uh, assay from uh, these tissue samples. And it's expressed differentially throughout the brain. It's, it's, it's fairly um, uh, uh, moderate expression uh, early, in, early in development. And then after birth, it levels out in most brain regions, the cortex, the hippocampus, uh, striatum, but it continues to go up at the very, and may, is very high throughout lifetime uh, in the cerebellum. And this is likely uh, a reason for many of the cerebellar uh, uh, issues with regard to the more severe disorder. So it, it's required early in development, uh, it's differentially expressed during development, uh, and in the case of the cerebellum, it's increased uh, quite high uh, throughout life. So this, this tells us, okay, well, this tells us where the, where the channel is expressed uh, and, and gives us some information where, it's, where it is at certain points in life. But as Gerald mentioned, it's not quite so simple. Uh, the single CACNA1 gene with that single mutation for FHM or ataxia or what have you uh, is actually many forms in that sense that the, uh, the, the gene is alternatively spliced. And this uh, schematic just shows you some of the some of the regions um, uh, that are alternatively spliced. And in fact, there are dozens of possible variants of the channel due to alternative splicing. Hang on, I'm gonna stop this crow here. <laughs> that, that, that. 
that's pretty funny. Uh, Crow wants to listen. Uh, so, so there's multiple isoforms of, of, the, of the proteins that are made from this single gene. And again, that's going to complicate identification of how the pathology uh, manifests and how we could treat it. So these different variants, uh, again, so here's just an example of the one Gerald showed, the short versus the long at, the, at one end. And this, this shows us that in fact, they're differentially expressed. So, so even though you have these two variants, they're not equally expressed in the brain. Uh, so in this case, uh, the long form is much higher expressed, about uh, three or four times as high level of expression uh, in the human cortex compared to the shorter form. If you look uh, also uh, at other variants, uh, we can we can so there's 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 differences in expression related to sex. Uh, here we have a two splice variants, the EFA, the EFB, and the top panel here you, uh, on the on the left, uh, these are men at different ages, and on the bottom are women at different ages, and you can see just the relative expression just looking at the colors, uh, white versus dark that, uh, for example, younger men have a much higher expression of the EFA splice variant, and that drops off dramatically as they get into their 40s and, and is much lower. So whatever that EFA to EFB change is doing, it's, it's differentially expressed between men and women. And then also, not just sex, but if you look in the frontal cortex on the right or the substantia nigra, other parts of the brain, you can see that men and, men and women differentially express uh, this, this splice variant in different parts of the brain. So again, we, even though it's a single gene, we have a very complex expression and there's different isoforms. Does that really mean anything uh, to the channel, what the channel's doing? And the answer is ab absolutely yes. If we look here, and this is not important what this means, if you just look in the lower panel on the right, uh, you can see that this PQ type channel is modulated by calcium coming in through, it, through the channel itself. Um, and, and, and the, uh, one mutation, the milder mutation, R192Q, it decreases this modulation uh, by about 50 or 60%, but the more severe allele causes complete removal of the ability of this channel to be modulated uh, by calcium coming in through itself. So this channel, whatever it's doing with this particular mutation uh, is going to have a much more severe phenotype compared to the more milder one with regard to the channel biophysical properties. So that again gives us some, some clues as to, as to what we wanna target with regard to uh, mutations. What about uh, where these channels are in the brain uh, and what they're doing at the, at the circuit level? Uh, and in the whole brain level. Well, to understand that, we need to have uh, accurate human models uh, of, of the disorder. And Gerald talked about knockout, where you, you completely eliminate the, uh, the phenotype of the, uh, or the, the function of the gene by knocking out the gene itself. Uh, Arnman Vandenberg, um, uh, over the years, has done some beautiful work uh, where he's created knock-in mice representing these two alleles, the S218L uh, severe allele and the R192Q mild allele in mice. So these, these mice have their normal PQ type channel and their normal CACNA1 channel, except with single missense mutation from these uh, identified in these patients. And what happens is, is quite remarkable in the sense of, um, oh, I don't know if this is gonna show a movie. Is this, do you guys have the full, full screen view here? Or not? I don't think so. No, you don't have. I, 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 why is this not showing the? Uh, well, this mouse, if the movie was working, this mouse would show a very dramatic hemiplegia uh, where it, it, it uh, has a tax of hemiplegia where it's, it, it's uh, essentially paralyzed on one side. And so, similar to humans with a severe allele, uh, the mice show uh, uh, a hemiplegia. Uh, and if we look at a variety of different phenotypes between the mice and the human, uh, between the two uh, strains that were created by, by our lab, you can see that they exactly mimic the human phenotype. So we have very nice models for the severe allele in the mice, hemiplegia, ataxia. Uh, they show uh, increased mortality. They show both absence and generalized uh, uh, seizures. Uh, and uh, uh, comparatively, the mild allele doesn't show any of these uh, overt behavioral phenotypes. So, but did, are the splice variants different in these mice uh, expression-wise compared to what we, we saw in the human data? And the answer is absolutely yes. If we scan uh, uh, these mice for expression of, for example, of different 
um, splice isoforms uh, plus and minus N and P or splicing of the exon 37. Uh, we can see that these mice uh, indeed have different, both the, var the variants that were identified in humans and importantly, that they're differentially expressed in the brain. Uh, for example, this NP e channels containing NP and EFB uh, have certain characteristics when we look at their functional properties compared to those channels with uh, minus NP and EFA, the other com another combination. And in fact, one would expect that um, uh, the ones with the uh, uh, um, animals with the uh, plus NP EFB would have a pharmacology consistent with a, a, a Q-type calcium channel, uh, and that would show calcium-dependent modulation or inhibition, whereas the ones with the minus NP, which would be a P-type channel pharmacology and would show calcium-dependent facilitation, and that's what they do. So very, uh, um, we can also uh, uh, look at these mice using brain slices, and I won't go into the gory details, uh, we can chop up the brain from these, these transgenic mice and show that the modulation of these channels occurs at the level of the synapses uh, and the neurons and the circuitry, as, as expected from what we see from the mutations themselves. Another phenomenon associated with, with migraine, especially FHM, is, um, is aura. And my, uh, the aura has uh, been described and is generally accepted now to be what uh, uh, is um, uh, either, it's either an auditory or it can be a visual aura. Uh, and it is due to a phenomenon called spreading depolarization. Spreading depolarization is a, is a wave front of massive neuronal excitation that travels throughout the brain at two to six millimeters per, uh, per minute. And it renders the, the uh, everything after that, after that wave uh, inactive for, for several minutes. And that, um, that wave actually is the aura. So when it crosses the visual system in the cortex, the visual cortex, that's when people see the visual aura of spot, usually a dark spot moving across. That's the actual spreading depolarization wave. Uh, um, and these, to look at this, we actually uh, wanted to see whether these mice could, could um, possess the spreading depolarization. We can't measure aura. Uh, uh, or, or we can't ask them whether they're having a migraine. So we employed uh, diffusion-weighted MRI. Uh, and uh, indeed, we showed that uh, in, uh, we could measure in real time in live mice uh, with these mutations compared to wild type, the spreading depolarization uh, in both animals. Notably, in, in wild type, the spreading depolarization, so these animals don't ever have any of the phenotypes of the CACNA1 mutation. Uh, the spreading depolarization that we induce is always contained or, or, or localized to the cortex, whereas in the more severe allele, it spreads subcortically, very, very rapidly uh, into the hippocampus, striatum, and other brain regions. So we can measure various aspects of the pathophysiology uh, at the cellular, the synaptic, and the whole brain level uh, in, these, in these nice models. So one of the things we found, that, as I mentioned, that these mice, uh, uh, this very severe allele can drop dead, uh, and when we measure these uh, spreading depolarization, uh, and every time we measure the spreading depolarization in the MRI, uh, the, uh, in the S218L mice, uh, uh, it was non-fatal if the spreading depolarization did not invade the brainstem. The brainstem is where you have your respiratory and cardiovascular uh, uh, centers for, for automatic control of breathing and, and heart uh, rate. So, um, it and it never invaded the brainstem uh, in wild type. But in the S218L, when they, when they were non-fatal, it never went into the brain stem. But when they were fatal, in 100% of the animals, the spreading depolarization entered the brain stem, their uh, heart stopped, and then a few minutes later, they stopped breathing. So we can use this model as a very good uh, ex um, uh, uh, mimic of what's happened uh, in both the, mo the mild and the severe alleles of FHM. So the take home here uh, is, is that these FHM or, spont uh, or uh, 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 sporadic mutations in CACNA1 change a lot of things. They're all gain of function changes for the most part, increase changing the channel conductance, uh, affecting which neurotransmitters are released in particular pathways with, with regard to either excitatory or inhibitory, uh, right through to causing cortical spreading depolarization. And so this complicates, obviously, uh, everything with regard to treating these disorders or coming up with treatments. There's more than one thing gone wrong. It's happening in different parts of the brain. 
uh, uh, phenotypically, uh, and there's many subtypes of the channel from alternative splicing. Just to show you one uh, example of what we've tried here, just chronic pregabalin to the, uh, uh, the mice, S218 severe mice. If we treat them chronically with uh, a, a fairly uh, modest dose of pregabalin uh, and stimulate cortical spreading depolarization, we can actually decrease, we increase the threshold of spreading uh, depolarization uh, compared to the wild type or the animals that have the mutation with no pregabalin. So we can affect spreading depolarization uh, at, at threshold wise with a generic drug, uh, pregabalin or gabapentin uh, that are, is used to treat pain and epilepsy. What about more ideas for more, more specifically targeting that, you know, rather than just taking a drug that's gonna affect all, all your PQ type channels everywhere, uh, um, what about more specific targeting? Can we actually affect the targets in circuitry we're interested in? And one of the things uh, um, uh, uh, would be, uh, I would suggest would be lipid nanoparticles. So lipid nanoparticles, you're all familiar with these if you've been vaccinated by either the Pfizer or Moderna. So this fellow here beside me, Peter Cullis, invented the, uh, the lipid nanoparticles that are used in the Pfizer uh, 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 vaccine. Uh, and he's a colleague here at, at UBC. And we've been working with Peter for some time. And we've, we've uh, found that we can directly inject LNPs into the brain containing certain uh, genetic uh, uh, agents. And I'm not gonna go in the data, but we can inject them into the brain, wait a few weeks, and they're very, very rapidly taken up in, into neurons. Uh, and what happens um, uh, when we do that is that we can affect channel function in certain parts of the brain. So this is not the CACNA, uh, uh, channel, but this is a, this is a, a different experiment where we it filled those lipid nanoparticles with a, uh, a, a piece of a, uh, a different calcium channel gene that was causing uh, uh, epilepsy, uh, absence seizures in, in a particular model. We injected those lipid nanoparticles containing that little bit of antisense R uh, R RNA uh, and into the thalamus or near the thalamus and when we uh, waited two weeks and went back and looked at whether these animals were having seizures, we could actually uh, block uh, about 80% of the seizure activity. So we could direct this genetic alteration uh, to knock down this channel in, in just one part of the brain that's responsible for those seizures. So this is obviously a very different approach, uh, this type of genetic directed uh, injection into the brain uh, compared to just a drug. Um, what about the splicing? We can actually, uh, what if we just want to change the splice variants where the mutations are? And again, here, this is an example of uh, what we've done for another gene. We've, we've taken, uh, here's these boxes here, 24, 25, 26, represent the protein coding regions. And we've designed little uh, oligonucleotides or bits to flank this particular splice variant. And when we uh, test this in, in the test tube, we can dramatically knock down that one splice variant. Uh, on its own. And, and so that would affect, uh, or give us an idea that we could affect splicing of certain uh, uh, CACNA1 exons or, or variants that might be causing us uh, particularly uh, bad issues with, with concerning phenotype. So, uh, you know, I won't go through all this again, we're over time, but there's a lot of basic biology, a lot of basic physiology that we still need to understand. Uh, we can use these animal models to, to help us understand this. We can use the animal models for testing our ideas with regard to uh, therapeutic intervention, whether that's targeted or small molecule, just uh, oral or, or, or uh, injection of drugs. Uh, and what the goal would be overall would be to, you know, would be to, best of all, would be to target those uh, mutations that are causing the more severe disease, but targeting them in a, in a way that's only going to affect those brain regions uh, where they are a particular problem with regard to that, that phenotype. So just to remind you, uh, you've heard it uh, from, uh, from Tracy uh, earlier, if you were on her talk, that, that this whole drug discovery uh, effort is, is a long approach. I think for the CACNA, uh, we're still in the, the R&D stage. There are many more stages to go. Um, uh, and it's not, a, it's not a short process. It's not an inexpensive process. Here's an example of where, where myself and, and Gerald was involved in this also. Uh, designed small organics against the n-type calcium channel, so a different channel for pain. Uh, first cloned that in 1992. Over the, over the next 12 years, uh, uh, we raised about $150 million from venture capital. 
another 30 million was put in by Merck. Uh, and then uh, uh, from about 2004, 2011, we conducted uh, four or five clinical trials. Uh, and so this whole process uh, from target identification through to clinical trials phase two, where you're actually gonna get meaningful data, uh, was a very, very long process um, and expensive. And at the end of the day, for this particular drug, it actually failed. So after 100 plus million dollars and, and 12 or 15 years of, of testing, uh, the drug actually didn't work. So it's, it's not, a, it's not a, 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 a pass for the faint of heart, but uh, listening to your stories uh, about your, your kids, uh, it's clearly one that has to be taken. And, and quite frankly, the more people you get involved, the better. It's gonna, it's gonna require a lot of different approaches uh, and uh, hopefully one or more of them would work out. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, and I think just to sort of also piggyback a little bit on the last presentation with Wendy Chung, um, the importance of having our, um, our registry really does. I mean, I think, can you speak to how that plays into this, this research? And that, I mean, we've been told that, that that's the secret to getting companies and researchers more interested is being able to show that you have a community, that you have numbers. Um, can you speak to that a little bit for our community that's sort of still wondering about the, the registry and, and what it means? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, well, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's huge benefit in numbers. So the more, the more involved in the registry and the more that, that, that become part of the uh, CACNA One uh, Foundation, the better. Um, I, I think uh, the, one of the most important points from the registry from the science, the R&D side, is that uh, there's only so many things that can go wrong with the channel. The big picture, it can be a gain of function or it can be a loss of function. The complexity, and, and so when, 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 when these kids uh, become part of the registry and, and the mutation is determined, they're going to fall into, uh, you know, an amino acid is going to be identified as being altered or, or one or more amino, acid, amino acids, and it's going to fall into where in the channel is that amino acid change occurring and how is it causing either a gain of function or a loss of function? And, and the more that we have of those numbers adding up, we will it become much clearer that this is a direct path for small organic molecules that really selectively target gain of function. Uh, and with these other mutations in this other part of the channel, it may be that, you know what, they're all focused around a particular splice variant region and we know if we can change that splicing in that region, we can knock out that, that target of the channel where those mutations are. So that'll give us a huge amount of information uh, with regard to um, uh, you know, where, what amino acids should be targeted for what pathophysiology. It's crucial. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. So I'll read, this is from Lisa actually. Is the work you are doing focused mo mostly on gain of function variants what about potentiating an underactive channel? Is that a more complex um, to develop a therapeutic for? Great question. Gerald, make you speak. Make me speak, yeah. <clears throat> you can hear me, yeah. Yeah, it, it, is, it's, it is trickier because there are many ways to actually inhibit function of a channel. And you can use now the structures that are available for some of the other CAF2 channels and model the PQ channel after that and design molecules that will block it. It may not be selective, but you can block them. But to actually have anything that boosts channel function is more difficult. Now, it has been very successful uh, with the L-type channels. There's a compound called BK, which is a booster of L-channel activity. So it's not inconceivable you can do that, but it's more difficult to do. Doesn't mean it can't be done. And if, you know, if there is enough uh, uh, will to do it, there are a lot of smart people out there that certainly have the capability to, to have a good go at it. Well, thank you. Um, thank you both for your time and all the work that you're doing to support um, our CACNA 1A family members and research. Um, and, oh, well, I, let me ask one more question. Um, what do you think about mesenchymal, I may be saying that incorrectly, stem cell treatments? M-E-S-E-N-C-H-Y-M-A-L, stem cell treatments. Terry, you take that one. Well, I'm just gonna say, I, I, you know, uh, um, 
So, you know, that's, I, I don't know, but I'm not a clinician and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a more appropriate uh, question for Jeff Nobles, who's the next speaker after the break. But uh, stem, stem cell treatments have been tried in Parkinson's, uh, as you, you probably all know, um, is to mixed uh, effect. Um, I, I think uh, there's a huge benefit in, in stem cell research in this area. I think taking or, or, or making uh, uh, stem cells from HACNA1 patients is a, cert, is a really valid path to go down. Uh, and it's, it's doable at many sites uh, and labs around the world. The actual treatment part, um, you know, I think there, there, there's, 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 the jury's still out uh, with regard to stem cells being used in various parts of the body. As you know, they've been, as I said, in Parkinson's, they've been, people are trying to uh, use them in the heart or thinking about using them in the heart. Uh, it's still unclear whether, whether you're gonna get a long-term effect or whether you'll get a transient effect uh, with stem cells. But I, again, probably best for, uh, for Jeff to answer that. Again, thank you for all of your time and all of the work that you are doing. Thank you.